Hello and welcome to the NC Podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I am your host. I'm also the founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its members club for landlords and property investors to come and build a profitable property portfolio, which completely aligns with their goals. This week, I have got another very special guest. I've got Danielle Lester with me. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. That's all right. No <laughs> problem. I hope it's not too nerve-wracking. Right it's here. a little bit. A little bit. It's quite intimidating, isn't it? It is. I'm a massive fan of podcasts, though, so I'm like, right, got to, got to start somewhere, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and this is quite a friendly environment yes, to be yes, in. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, we've known each other now for a couple of months. You were one of the first people that I probably met when I came to New York. Yeah, that was the um, the RICS event, wasn't it? The um, I think it was, it wasn't long after you'd got here, wasn't it? No, it was yeah. about a month after I got here. I just moved to Brooklyn, literally that week, and the RICS emailed me and said, we've got an event in Midtown, and it was about one Vanderbilt. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and that was where we were introduced to each other. That's it, goodness Wow, that's gone quick. It's gone really quick, hasn't it? And the reason we were introduced to each other is because we're both academics. Yep. Do you like that word? Not really. It makes me, <laughs> it makes me go, oh, really? Am I? Yeah, that's the same. That I, I feel that as well. So you teach at NYU. Yeah, I'm a clinical assistant professor there. I'm just, just heading towards the end of my second academic year there. Um, I'm actually in a love of the program as well. I, I did the um, masters in construction management uh, a few years back before heading back to Australia, where I did my PhD. Mm-hmm. I've basically been sort of moving from <clears throat> between the UK, Australia, and the US for the last sort of twelve years or so, um, working in industry, doing various sort of academic programs myself, and now I'm teaching here in in New York. So. You've you've had a great background. Your your the your career has been the sort of thing that my students say to me. I wish I could travel the world and work in property. So how have you done it? Yeah, it's been it's been amazing. I mean, you know, it's been pretty unconventional. I guess, sort of thinking back, I sort of started. Um, I did obviously my sort of GCSEs and what have you in the UK. Then I went off to do um, my A levels. Uh, didn't do particularly well in the A levels, so started a HND. Uh, actually started HND in food science of really? all things, yeah, because I'd done I'd done relatively well in in my A level biology, and I thought, oh, I'll give that a crack. Then I've always been interested in that kind of thing, and uh, four weeks in was like, no, this isn't for me. Um, so I went off and did a HND in business and finance. Mm-hmm. I did that in uh, Staffordshire University in Stoke on Trent, and after two years of that, I was given the option to go on and do um, start on in the second year of a of of a of a degree program in the business school and all these courses were sort of put to me in terms of quantity surveying valuation surveying building surveying and I was like oh what are they mm-hmm. no one's ever talked to me about those before um and because of the prerequisite stuff that they have I ended up um on a valuation surveying degree okay yeah so I actually started off in the world of real estate valuation interesting it is isn't it considering yeah. where i am now <laughs> yeah. so um so finished that degree um knowing that i was really interested in the built environment always have been um but the th- first couple of job interviews i had kind of left left me sort of feeling a bit flat and thinking well, i'm not really sure that's what i want to do mm-hmm. um as in va- the valuation side of things um And that's when I realised I was far more technically minded and decided to try and pursue a a career in construction. So because of the crossover between the valuation surveying degrees and the QS degree at the time, um, I was able to sort of um, get myself my first job as an assistant QS. So for everybody listening, QS, quantity surveyor. That's right. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Um, And... Yeah, basically forged myself a a career in the UK as a QS. First job was um sitting under the elevated section of the M6 motorway really? in in Warsaw. Yes, oh. very close to the uh, the IKEA there on Junction <laughs> Nine. Um, we were doing uh, con- concrete pairs, uh, concrete repairs, and cathodic protection. Quite a mouthful. 
um, it, it, interestingly, I'd actually been, um, so it had been recommended to me by a lot of the recruitment consultants I was speaking to that I should um, try and get a job in house building if I was interested in construction because that was the closest link they had to my sort of valuation mm-hmm. um, degree. N- knowing what I know now, I realised they knew nothing about what I was trying to do anyway. Yeah. But um, so I started going to all these um, job interviews for house builders and it, I, I was just coming away feeling really quite bored I was like no they're all the same I'm not really that interested in yeah doing the same cookie cutter stuff you know and uh and then I went to this job interview on um uh, the M6 and they started talking about concrete repairs and sending um electrical current through the uh the rebar to stop it from rusting and just all this science was put to me and I was just like yeah I want to be part of that wow. that sounds amazing <laughs> so uh yeah started sort of did about four years in the UK as a as a QS uh working with um concrete subs um who else earthworks groundworks I worked for one general contractor um and then I'd always decided I wanted to travel with my job. Yeah. So I actually made two phone calls, one to a recruitment consultant in um Australia and one in the Caribbean. And Australia was just about to st- well, it was just starting its construction boom. Okay. Uh this was sort of like mid 2007. Mm-hmm. Um and ended up moving over there, ended up going over there for, for for some job interviews and ended up coming back with about three or four job offers. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, they were desperate for QSs, basically. Um, ended up going over there January 2008. Spent about four years over there working on larger and larger projects. We started mm-hmm. off on major projects and then I was on sort of like billion dollar tunnel projects where, interestingly enough, there wasn't any real understanding of what a quantity surveyor could do on these large scale projects so whereas I was used to being part of a team of QSs on much smaller projects in the UK I was now one of two quantity surveyors on like a two billion dollar job Wow! so it wasn't just a job of trying to commercially manage this project but at the same time it was a case of trying to coach and mentor people Mm -hmm. on understanding my role um and it was then, and all my involvement with the RICS and the Matrix, uh, the Young Professionals Group, and also being involved with sort of the National Association of Women in Construction, and I was I was heavily involved in the education and mentoring of of younger uh, graduates, mm-hmm. and always going into universities. Um, and that was when I started thinking I actually really enjoy that part of my job. Maybe I should consider the uh, an academic role. Um, I ended up coming back to the UK um, for various family reasons and then um, found myself at New York University doing my master's in construction management. I thought somebody had said to me in Australia, um, if you want to be a lecturer, you're going to have to get a PhD. Mm-hmm. And I remember at the time thinking, no, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I work on spreadsheets. Yeah. I get, how, how am I going to do a PhD? Um, and ended up doing my master's. And whilst I was there, just felt like I'd found my crowd, basically. I felt like I'd found that sort of intellectual group that I could sort of um, talk to about the the, the curious nature of the built environment. Mm -hmm. So through doing my master's at NYU, I was invited back to Australia, funnily enough, um, to do my PhD at the University of Queensland. Um, And so my master's was in construction management i then went on to do a phd in civil engineering and behavioral economics because they go together so well (laughs) well how did you did you have to decide on that title as well no no so so um basically i'd want I, i wanted to do a phd i wanted it to be something along the lines of commercial management I wanted to understand why we were constantly building or constantly starting these mega projects and we were just going into them making the same mistakes from day one Mm -hmm. on each project and I kept hearing over and over again um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel and Mm -hmm. I'm like actually that's exactly what we need to do we totally need to reinvent the wheel right now right all projects are completely different and if we're just going to go on start this one with the same mentality as the one that just completely 
you know, mm. panned, then um, we, we're doomed for failure. So I ended up, um, my actual focus for my topic of my PhD was um, the concepts of delusion and deception. Okay. Um, so Bent Floyberg, who is the head of um, the Masters of Program Management at Oxford University, um, he's done extensive research on mega projects. So anything over a um, billion dollars um, since time began, basically. Mm-hmm. And he's looked at sort of the quantitative and qualitative analysis of that, that all the data that's available. And he inferred that the project failure was always down to um, or, or could be very much um, attributed to human behaviour, mm-hmm. that being delusion and deception. So delusion being... Um, I feel like I'm going off on a tangent no, here. Is no, that okay? No, no, no. Do it, do it. <laughs> delusion, um, delusion being the inability to learn lessons between projects, hence the we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Well, yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, and the deception being the misalignment of incentives. So we put targets, we put metrics in place, and you know those are the targets and metrics that create the deceptive behaviour. So if we've got misaligned incentives between principal and agents and, and, and various mm-hmm. stakeholders, then there's, there's going to be, it creates a, a, an environment where deceptive behavior can occur. And if you've right. got delusion on top of that. It goes wrong. Yeah. So, so yeah, basically I started looking at um, what we do in education that could possibly create that type of decision-making behavior. Mm-hmm. Um. And what we could do to essentially mitigate it, you know, how could we change the way we deliver education? What what do we need to do in pedagogy and all that kind of stuff? Um, And it was a very explorative study. You know, it was very much a case of, right, I've got this opportunity to study this little group of people. And the the conclusions and ideas that I'm going to bring from it are very, very loosely connected. But it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. So... um, so, yeah, I looked at, you know, what we do that creates the certain decision making behaviours, what we can do to change them. And what does that essentially mean for industry? So so that sort of um, pushed me to my absolute limit of of, of everything, basically. Um, sort of my mental limit, my financial limit, my everything, because I was still moving around the world whilst I was mm-hmm. doing all of this. You were in different locations. Yeah. Doing PhD. Yeah. Oh. So I was based out of Australia, but um, because I was wanting to f- um, end up here, I was sort of traveling between the two places to try and sort of, uh, you know, get wow. jobs sorted and what have you. Plus, because I was working in Australia uh, and I was studying the group of students in Australia, you, t- you need to get distance from that group that you're studying so I was really needing to sort of take breaks and, and move around. And um, yeah, I became quite a nomad. But it was fun. It was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and now I'm here. So um, I'm back at NYU and I'm teaching um, on the real estate development track. I teach the development process, mm-hmm. uh, which is quite similar to a class I used to teach over in Australia to the engineers. I used to teach them... Um, project management and now I teach development process which is pretty much very similar you know to project management they just if I we called it project management nobody would sign up for it (laughs) (laughs) it's a difference in terminology right? yeah right (laughs) yeah (laughs) so that's something I do want to ask about how have you found trade being in the property industry in three different continents because I get um sometimes when I'm talking to developers over here, um I still find the different terminology kind of like I can get my head around it and I understand what they're trying to say, but sometimes I cannot make it match up with what we do in the UK. Like just because it just different things are taken into account. Yeah, I mean it is difficult. Um and and, and quite often you find that if you don't if you don't immediately understand what someone's saying because you've got to have a think about what their terminology means versus the terminology mm. you're used to then people can often think oh they don't know you, you don't yes. know what you're talking about 
Yes. So I'm just going to, I'm going to end this conversation here and move on to someone that does know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. I found that a lot. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> the one thing I found here particularly, and I don't know whether it's a different, and I, I don't know whether this is a cultural difference, a country difference or an industry difference, because obviously I'm also from the construction industry and the mm-hmm. construction industry and the real estate uh, folk tend to have completely different ways of communicating as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um, and I often, I often think that my, my students uh, struggle with my very basic terminology that I use um, because I'm not using... I've, I speak, spoke to my PhD advisor about this. I was like, why why over here in the US do people tend to sort of like ham up the words they're using? You know, there's this like sort of like having to express something on that next level, you know, to try and sell it a bit harder oh, or to try yeah. and, you know, sort of emphasise it a bit, bit more. And he's like, that's called encrypted mediocrity. And I was like, ooh, I like that too. <laughs> I'm taking that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it basically is sort of like how these disciplines create their own language so that only the insiders understand what's going yeah. on, you know? So so I don't go into my classroom and start talking about buzzwords and Oh, some of the words that, that I hear that I refuse to let people say in my office, things like leverage and ba- oh, bandwidth and, and things like that. And I'm like, no, guys, let's just talk what we mean. Let's just say what we mean, you know? <laughs> I, I, to be fair, I get that all of the time and people come at me and they're like, well, what yield or what return on investment? Or, But the thing that I always say back is, well, how can you compare what's what I'm doing, the, my return on investment versus your return on investment, unless we know that we're calculating the same thing? So I'd never, I never come at it from like a yield or um. In your class the other day, when your student asked me about cap rate, and I'm like, well, it's completely different in the UK. Yeah. I I can't compare that. Um, I I find that too. Whereas really on simple terms, I've, I I say to my students, it's about calculating the money. How much is coming in? versus how much the building is worth. And however you're getting to that, that's that's the benchmark data you need. I don't care about all these other stats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, one of one of the biggest things I, I sort of try and get my students to do is I mark them and I tell them I do this. Some of them take it on board, others don't. Mm. I'm there to uh, mark them basically on their ability to communicate and present their work. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not interested in what their deal is that they've got planned because as far as I'm concerned, anything's a goer. Yeah. You know, I'm not there to tell them, well, that's not going to go ahead. I can tell them it won't go ahead because they've not got enough information in there. They're not communicating mm. their ideas well enough or they're not presenting them in a, in a favourable way. Um, but I'm not going to stop them from trying to build something. Uh, the, the example I always use is if you want to go and build a pineapple-shaped hotel on Times Square... I'm sure somebody will buy into that. (laughs) But you have to put together a good enough proposal that explains exactly why you want to do it and how you're going to do it and all the things you've considered. And if you haven't got the information in there, then then it's not going to happen. Yeah. And you've got to be very open with it. That's actually, that could explain a lot of why people use these internal words or words that they think are clever is because they don't want to be open or transparent or they don't understand. That's, yeah. that's the other thing that I've, I've really very early on in the whole industry, not just in America, in the UK too, I guess it, where people try to outsmart me and that's fine. But sometimes I'm a bit like, is that really what you mean? Like, all I want you to do is just tell it to me in kind of layman's terms so that I know that we're on the same page. Yeah. And, and I've, I've often found that, um, I mean, obviously, based on the topic that I looked at for my my um, PhD, I'm not afraid to sort of challenge the norm mm. and I'm not afraid to question things that I don't think are right. Um, but I think my blatant honesty often comes across as naivety because I find that people in industry are, are often sort of like, well, she's if she's if she's prepared to just come out and say that, she clearly doesn't know how to play the game. Oh, yeah, you know? games. Yes. 
Good old games. games. How, <laughs> how many times do you come across someone in the property industry and you say, why are you playing? What? I'm not getting on board. I'm just telling you, like, I'm going to tell you how it is. And that's the one thing. Um, and I think anybody who's listening and you can relate to us when we say that there's people in the industry who will play games with you. And we've seen it a lot. Anybody who's on Facebook and you've been following a lot of all of the different groups at the moment, people are calling um, sources out and lenders out. Or when I say lenders, um, I mean small kind of people who are lending out of their back pocket kind of thing who would play a game and then never do what they say they're going to. And I think everybody to a certain extent can relate in this industry to the fact that you come across that sometimes and you have to just almost dig to uncover it or just go, you know what, I'm not doing this. You know, I'm going to find a different route. I don't need to do that. I think it's, it's a global thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it keeps the, it keeps everything interesting, but a, a lot of a sort of, uh, you know, one of the biggest findings in my work was um, the, the difference between those that are extrinsically motivated <clears throat> and those are, that are intrinsically motivated. So those that are there for the, the quick reward and the quick deal and those that are there for the uh, interest and enjoyment of what they actually do. Mm -hmm. And there was this also this little group of people, young students, excuse me, <clears throat> who were very got very anxious and very stressed about the conflict between understanding that they had joined this industry because of the the interest and enjoyment they had in something mm -hmm. but then had to sort of felt the need to 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 force themselves into this extrinsic understanding of the world mm -hmm. so they were really quite anxious about well i realized that you know i've got to i, I want to do x y and z or z <laughs> Um, but I'm actually going to ha probably have to do this because this is what industry is dictating that I need to do rather than, you know, really sort of following their dreams, following their ideas, following those, you know, you know, innovations and mm. things. So, And being innovative is what changes the industry. Yeah. And slowly we're starting to see ripples. Slowly I'm starting to come across things and think, wow, like you are just absolutely thinking about things from a completely different different mindset or you're open to new new ideas i mean i've i've very much at the moment following a lot of the changes in lending and the fact that we're going to be able to do it digitally and they're going to give you a risk based upon your own risk factor i like that idea rather than just this blanket you get in contact with a mortgage lender and you know you then end up just going through their hoops it's and that seems to be industry wide. And that's something that I've seen both in the US and the UK coming together at once. And I love that. But that's people thinking outside the box and thinking I can change what's going on right now. Yeah. And I think there's going to be more of that that happens because I know from my own sort of personal perspective, sort of some of the challenges I've had, particularly when I'm living between three countries, essentially working on three currencies. I've got an income here and a little bit of an income there and, a you know, everything's all over the place yeah. so since I've come here and I've sort of settled into sort of my two years here at, at, in New York um some of the challenges I've faced with with my bank in England for example who I, I've been banking with them for like oh, how long like 30 odd years mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when I went to see them in the transition between moving between um well, I don't know where I was at the time, but I was trying to move here <laughs> permanently. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to them and asked them if they could help me out with some, you know, overdraft or something just to cover me until yeah. my first salary check came in. And they just said no. And, I was, and, 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 and even the guy that I was talking to finally got on board and was like, hang on a minute, I've got to make a few phone calls for you here. This doesn't make sense. You've been a customer of ours for 30 years. You're basically asking for about £500 of extended <laughs> yeah. overdraft. You've got your contracts here to say you're going to go and be a, a you know, a, a professor at NYU. And all I kept feeling like was that everything I'd done was, was wrong and I should never have, um, I should never have, um, started the phd yeah. process never sh never should have followed my dreams and 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 sort of studied and all that kind of stuff and 
And, and a similar thing happened in Australia when I was trying to sort of consolidate some of the, the debt I'd accumulated over there. Um, they were like, no, we can't really help. And, and, and the, the whole time I just kept thinking, I had to really change my mindset because I kept thinking, I'm not going to have the banks tell me that I've made a mistake and I've done something wrong. Mm. No, you should never have lent me the money in the first place. So that's why I've now sort of flipped it on its head and I've started thinking, no, there are new... There, People out there are people out there who are, are who are sick and tired of the sort of same old algorithm nonsense that comes from the banks. Mm -hmm. Yes, of of obviously there's there's risk assessments that need to take place, but there's so much more in the way of qualitative data that you need yes. to understand. And considering they take data on you for everything, I mean, we could have a conversation. It pop up on yeah. like as an ad somewhere yeah. on the internet. You know, it's. I'm glad that sort of thing is changing and you can see it with things like transfer wise as well where you can now have that bank account that operates in all currencies I mean that for me I don't I don't have loads of money in it but it really helps me pay staff that are overseas or consultants that are overseas because that's really helpful and I like seeing that change but that's come from somebody who's gone to hell with the norm yeah I can do this differently and I'm yeah. so excited that technology has allowed that to happen and I I'm hoping we see more of that in the industry. Yeah, definitely. People go and no, we don't have to follow the traditional sort of landscape. We don't have to do things the way that everybody says that's just the way it is. Oh yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah, I'm all for me, that. Me too, because it's, <laughs> it's also you don't need that traditional idea of a career anymore. And I've spoken at length about that on this podcast. That as well, if you have an idea. There's other people who get on board with that as well in the property yeah. industry. Yeah. And if you can do something differently and you see that, go and try and do it. And even, I've always said to people, even if you just want someone to champion you, get in contact with me. I'm love, I love <laughs> I love hearing new ideas, but you just need to build that support. And then that's where the momentum comes from. The more people you talk to about it, the more enthusiastic you are. And slowly but surely we'll start seeing the industry change. Not that it's a terrible industry because we're both in it, but I've, but it's really enlightening, isn't it, to have these conversations? Like even when we, you and I speak, we're like, oh wow, you know, we've both been feeling the same thing, and yeah, thank gosh, like you're just acknowledging other people's thought process, and I think that's also where diversity will start becoming uh, more. We will become a more diverse industry as people have more ideas and it's accepted. Yeah, no, definitely. Th you know, that that whole breaking down the norms. Um, uh, I, 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 it's starting to happen. I think it's, you know, it, very, very slowly. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's, there's, there's some change happening. Um, I have days when I feel like there's no change happening and we've gone backwards. But um, no, there's definitely there's definitely change happening. And um, I mean, for all the struggles I have in the classroom, you know, because I do have some struggles, especially here in New York. I think um, one of the one of the struggles I've had is that you know, who the, the the students get this feeling of of who's this who's this young British female PhD teaching me in this classroom at the moment? You know, um, what how how is she going to teach me how to make a lot of money as a real estate developer? Yeah. <laughs> But, the, but at the same time, I've had so many young female students come to me saying, I chose your class especially because uh, you're a strong female role model for the industry. And mm -hmm. and that that really, just, you know, knocked me back going, oh, wow, okay. How awesome So that? you actually sort of looked at the names on the, yeah. you didn't just pick one that suited your timetable. You were like, mm. oh, no. They said, yeah, we, we, we thought it said Daniel and it didn't. It said Danielle. And I was like, okay, thanks. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> get that a lot <laughs> <laughs> so do you think and I guess this is the question that we we need to touch on because the whole statistic with only 14 percent of our industry being women do you find that do you find you encounter any problems on a daily basis I'm always asked this question so I'm asking you because people ask me some days yeah some days no on a daily basis um not so much. I think um, I, I'm someone that tends to um, sort of reflect on my day or reflect on my week or reflect on on an interaction, and think to myself, "Hmm, 
did that happen because of this? Did that happen because of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, certain dynamics or whatever? Um, because I, even when I started out in my career, I was very much just, I'm Danielle, I, I'm come to work, I'm your colleague, and I don't see any difference mm. between the two of us. But at the same time, it you know, there was a few comments made that, 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 that quickly got shot down and stopped, that, on the construction site especially, um, that sort of made me realise that I didn't have a problem, but there was some people that maybe did feel uncomfortable because they were just so not used to having a woman on site, especially in civil infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, that more so now, more so now, definitely. But um, but on a day-to-day basis, um, I don't know, it's a difficult one. I mean, I do feel, I do have moments where I'm sort of wandering around midtown Manhattan, getting my lunch or whatever, and, and I just... I, I do have a moment where I'm like, wow, this is a very masculine area. <laughs> and everybody's dressed the same. Yes. Do people notice that they've gone out and got the same suits? You're probably from the same <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh. So that that's where I'm, I like being a woman because I can dress how I like. Well, it's funny you say that because uh, there's this event that I've been to for the last two years, actually two events in one day at the same hotel. One of them is the um, NYU Capital Markets Conference, mm-hmm. um, which is very, very male dominated. And then in the evening, they've they've had the uh, Women Executives of New York Real Estate. Um, they have the, the Woman of the Year Gala, which is for two years in a row. I didn't, I, I didn't go to them the gala last year but the two years before that two years in a row I was basically at the Pierre Hotel (laughs) for like 14 hours at the (laughs) conference followed by this gala and the difference being the human behavior person that I am now the Mm -hmm. difference in the room was just incredible I mean you know it was a very very male dominated room for the capital markets conference very dark everybody obviously wearing black or blue or gray suits uh, and and during the networking sessions, there was a very sort of low uh, mumble going on in the room, you know. And then you'd go into the, uh, the, the the sort of cocktail hour before the women's gala, and it was so bright, and there was such high pitch sort of um, networking going on. Wow. I, I, it just struck me. I just walk into the room and go, "Wow, this is a completely different dynamic to what was oh going on gosh. earlier on in the day at this hotel." But uh, but fa- fantastic all the same, you know, and and um, I've met some incredible women through that uh, through that organisation. I was a scholarship winner when I was at NYU, which has meant that I've always been able to go along to their events. So, brilliant. Yeah. So, do you have any advice to young ladies coming up through the industry right now? If you could say anything to your students, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I made a little list. And is this something that um, we're going to put out afterwards? Yes, definitely. Okay, so just before Danielle gives this advice, we're also going to give this to you in a printable um, and you will be able to go to ncrealestate.co.uk forward slash Danielle. I will put the link below in the show notes so make sure you pick that up, but go for it. Okay. The first five are very short and sweet and very sort of to the point. Basically, be yourself. Mm-hmm. That's all you can be. You can't be anybody else. Don't go to work trying to pretend to be somebody else because it you you will just exhaust yourself. Find your tribe. Find yourself the people that you align with in terms of your values and the type that your your work ethic and and the way you you view the world. Um, that's not going to happen immediately. People will come and go. As with personal friendships, it's the same with professional relationships. Uh, put yourself out there. This is something that's on my list now. Um, thanks to meeting Natasha, actually, um, sort of, and and seeing some of the work that she's been doing, which I think is incredible. Um, it's made me sort of think to myself how much I need to start putting myself out there. I'm pretty sure there's people out there that would be like, "No, you really already do." <laughs> <laughs> um, believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself first. Don't expect people to um constantly tell you you're doing right or you're doing well or what or, you know you have to trust in your own sort of in, um intuition and believe in yourself stay curious mm. constantly question constantly think constantly learn constantly find out new things new areas um 
uh, in the industry, new new things that are being looked at in the built environment. There's so much that go, that's going on in terms of um, CPD. Um, just just get out there and and, and learn. Um, and 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 learn outside of your comfort zone, definitely. Yeah. Um. Do whatever you need to do to get you through tough times. Yes. Yeah, I think um we've both um used the services of Lionheart, haven't we? We have, yeah. Just an incredible, incredible resource. Mm-hmm. Um, offered to um surveyors with the RICS. In fact. In between me finishing my PhD and starting at NYU, um, I had a period where I had no income. Mm-hmm. So being <laughs> doing a PhD on cost overruns and schedule slippages obviously meant that I had to get it in, you know, under budget and early. So I submitted my PhD early, but nobody told me that my my scholarship would stop immediately, which sent me into immediate financial crisis. Wow. And the people that I spoke to about it, namely my family, <laughs> their immediate response was, how did you get yourself into that mess? And so, it was, so I started beating myself up about, you know, mm-hmm. the situation I was in. And I, I, I remember the first phone call I had with a lady at Lionheart who was like, hang on a minute, let's just take a step back. You are in the situation you're in because you finished your PhD early, okay? <laughs> yes. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, they are... Um, an incredible resource. Um, don't be afraid to say what's on your mind. Okay. Mm-hmm. Chances are someone else has had a similar experience. True. True. I spent years hiding things and then I'd say something and people would be like, yeah, me too. And I'm like, oh, we well, just validated everything I thought. Yeah. Which is good. Reassuring, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. So don't be afraid to... Um, to, to, to say what's on your mind because chances are people will have somebody will have gone through a similar experience and be able to help you navigate if you are struggling take time for yourself something I've written on there on my list of things that I would really like to sort of do myself <laughs> but um yeah I need to write it in big writing on my wall in my in my uh in my flat I think um definitely take time for yourself it's very easy especially here in new york because there is always events going on um in our industry there is always like i said about these i did say didn't i go out to get to get go out and learn go out and join in the cpd events but at the same time don't feel obliged to go to everything mm-hmm. you know you really have to uh, there's nothing wrong with project managing your life and therefore scheduling in time to take care of yourself if you have to do it that way you have to do it that way but Mm -hmm. it's so important isn't it um don't be afraid to challenge and question yeah um i've often sort of you know throughout my career in i guess i was a bit naive in the early days where i would just challenge things and question things and and (laughs) and then get not get invited to the next meeting or sort of (laughs) conversations would happen without me there Mm -hmm. um but now I realize that um as I'm challenging and questioning things throughout my career and if somebody says to me why do you need to know that then I know I've asked the right question Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then finally patience have patience (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I agree with you, but it's hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. Something I always tell my students because you just want to make the most of, of the time that you've got wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You want to, you know, get the most from it. But you've also got to have patience that things will happen eventually if they're, if they're meant to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, for example, the, the two years of me being here... Um, it's been such a, a, a sort of life lesson in so many respects because, you know, I was moving between countries. I was doing mm. the master's and I was doing the PhD. I was moving between here, there and everywhere. And, 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 and once I'd got here and got the job, I felt like I needed to, things to keep moving at that speed. Yeah. And then I realised that, no, they didn't have to move at that speed. And I could, I could you know, re-engage with society and get some form of normal life back. So, of course, I started training for the marathon 
And now you're training for... Uh... Oh, now I'm training for the half Iron Man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't take things no, easy. No, that's it. Well, I thought, push push the mind to the limit with a PhD, and now it's time to push the body. And I turned yeah. 40 last year, so I'm like, right, it's time for a crazy challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm so inspired by you doing all of that, because I go home and I think, okay. I could take a leaf out of Nanny Owl's book and I like the idea that you're training for a half Iron Man plus you're teaching plus you do everything else that you're doing. So thank you. Because every time I come and sit and talk to you, I get inspired. I get ideas. And I'm like, yes, now I can do more. Yeah. So I appreciate having met you. We can have those conversations. Oh, bless you. So we're just about to wrap up. But before we do, we need to talk about something that we're going to be going to next month. Oh, yes, that's right. So next month, Danielle and I are going to the World Built Environment Forum. And I have very kindly, again, been um, given a uh, ticket by the RICS to go, which is very kind of them. I'm going to be doing some podcasting around it, which I'm very excited about. Um, if you didn't listen to my last year's podcast when I went to the Built Environment uh, World Built Environment Forum in London, you definitely should. It's called The Corbin Fear, my insight from the World Built Environment back on the 24th of April last year. So go back and have a listen to that. Um, it's being held in New York, so I appreciate it. It's a long way to come. But if you are in New York on the 13th and 14th of May and you would like to come to the World Built Environment Forum because it's going to be incredibly useful, I find it every year they bring together so many awesome speakers who tell you about what's happening not just in your local country but in the whole world and how the property market works on a global basis then definitely come along and I've got some discount codes so if you're a student or an academic you can use the code next gen and I'll put that below to get half off or Otherwise, I've got a code for RICS 700, which gives you 25% off the tickets. So if you do want to come to the World Built Environment Forum, I'm going to put all of the details below. Click the link, make sure you sign up, and then do let me know if you're coming. I'd love to come and say hi. Um, you can email me and let me know, natasha at mcrealestate.co.uk, or you could follow me on Twitter and Instagram and let me know. It's at Natasha C. Collins. Um, and I'd love to say hi if you're coming to the World Built Environment Forum because we're going to be there. We're going to try and get to as many events as possible. Yep, definitely. We're going to try and do some podcasting. Will you come back on the podcast? Absolutely, if you'll have me. Definitely. Always invited. And we're going to organise something for the World Built, Built Environment Forum. So... That brings us to the end of this podcast. Thank you. So soon. I know. Doesn't it time fly <laughs> on this flew. podcast? <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you want to find out more about me, head on over to www.ncrealestate.co.uk. I'm going to put everything we've been through today in the show notes below. Uh, remember, you can pick up the printable from Danielle at uh, ncrealestate.co.uk forward slash Danielle. Again, everything's going in the show notes. Thank you for listening this week. I cannot wait to catch up with you again soon.